I'm going to um, go through each of the four M's, which is um, part of a comprehensive geriatric assessment. I'm going to start with polypharmacy. So polypharmacy is identified or defined as taking five or more, sometimes four or more, um, medications daily. So you're required or you do take five, four to five or more medications daily. And this is any combination of prescription medicines, um, over-the-counter medications that you may have bought yourself or um, that a uh, provider, healthcare provider may have recommended that you use, um, nutrition and herbal supplements. So it's everything that the patient is taking, whether they consider it to be medicines or not. Diagnosis of multiple chronic comorbidities requiring um, concurrent use of multiple medications, being prescribed more medications than is necessary, um, increasing use of multiple medications is associated with increased health care costs and um, increased potential for dosing um, adherence issues or misdosing, incorrect dosing or medication interaction. The goal why we do uh, medication reconciliation at every visit, every time, is to um, assist the patient to de-prescribe if possible. If they're taking three medications to, to treat one condition, we could cut it down to one. Um, or also, sometimes uh, patients are taking medication that they have no idea why they're taking that medication. They've been on it for so long, they started it and they never stopped. So that would be something to, to uh, speak to them, educate the family, educate the patient, the community resident, and take that off. Um, so that's de-prescribing is trying to cut down and just, as I said, decrease the um, possibility of having um, medication interactions and also having um, adherence issues or major adherence problems. Um, however, while we're trying to de-prescribe and cut down medications, we should never under-prescribe for um, older adults because we think that um, they would not derive benefit from this medication. We should always attempt, if it's uh, medically necessary and the, the literature supports it, um, start with the adage that we use, start at a low dose and titrate up slowly and uh, assess um, um, for interactions or for adverse reactions. Okay. <coughs> Adverse effects of polypharmacy is associated with increased use of multiple medications, as I said before, higher health care costs, increased risk and actual medication to medication interactions, medication noncompliance, and medication to um, illness or disease or diagnosis interactions, the Deve development of worsening multiple geriatric syndromes, and that's covered in another SLM by one of our other providers. Providers should reconcile, as I said before, all medications that um, patients or community residents are taking, um, including prescriptions, over-the-counter medications, nutrition, herbal supplements at every visit, every time. The 2019 updated BEERS criteria for potentially inappropriate medication use in older adults um, is similar to the one that, was, that came out in 2015. Um, it includes the same five main categories as the 2015, but um, it, I think the age range is a little bit different. And number one, the five um, main categories of the 2019 updated beers is um, to identify potentially inappropriate medication in older adults. Two, um, potentially in those that we identify, they should be avoided in older adults with cer certain conditions. Um, it should be used with considerable caution in older adults. Um, combinations that may lead to harmful interactions should be identified um, and hopefully eliminated or um, limited use. And a list of medication that should be avoided or dosed differently for those with poor renal function. So those are the criteria covered under the 2019, 2015 and now updated 2019 BEERS criteria. The other, um, another of the four M's that I'm going to address is mobility. And each, as I said before, each of the four M's interact with the other three M's. So as you could see, if there is polypharmacy or um, dosage um, adherence issues um, with the older adult is actually going to affect their mobility. So this is where we assess um, for functional status. And the functional status is the most important determinant of quality of life 
for older adults. Independence in performing their ADLs includes the related con concepts of functional capacity, which is an individual's ability to perform normal daily activities, fu fulfill usual roles, and maintain health and wellness. Um, and functional performance, a self-report, so they tell us, that measures an individual's ability to perform, complete, perform and complete their activities of daily living. There are a few um, screening instruments that are used to assess um, patients and community residents' functional abilities and deficits in their ADLs, their activities of daily living, or their independent activities of daily living can signal the need for more in-depth evaluation of the patient's socio-environmental circumstances and the need for additional assistance. And I'm going to cover a few of those. <coughs> Um, you should be seeing right now the CATS um, index of independence in activities of daily living. Um, and this is a 10-point scale um, of self-reported. We ask questions and the patient tells us what's happening with them. And a score of 6 equals um, high, a patient is in considered independent, uh, and a score of 0 or um, up to 5 is um, considered low or maybe the patient is in the, um, dependent or requires supervision or assistance in their um, activities of daily living or their IADLs also. Um, the Bartlett's, which you should be viewing right now, activities of daily living index scale consists of 10 items with a combined maximum score of 100 and 100 being high or normal. Um, and it's similar to the, um, the cats, um, we're assessing their ADL, which is ability to feed themselves, bathe themselves, groom themselves, and which includes um, selecting the appropriate clothes for the season and actually putting those clothes on, which is ne next is dressing. Um, their uh, bowel habits, um, do they have chronic constipation, IBS, um, anything else that's happening with them, and are they able to um, toilet themselves? So that comes into um, toileting issues. Are they able to go to the bathroom on their own, um, or do they have to wear adult underwear? or do they um, require assistance when they go to the bathroom, they forget to wipe or they forget to flush. So that's, this is a screening test for that. Um, and um, this is also includes um, urinary um, incontinence, urinary um, nocturia, getting up at night, or not are being incontinent of urine also. Transferring from bed to chair, are they able to get up at, at, from the bed and get to the chair by themselves, or do they re require assistance, or are they wheelchair bound or bed bound? <coughs> Their mobility, are they ambulating on their own or do they require an assisted device to assist their ambulation and their mobility, a cane, a rollator, a walker, or they're, just, or they're holding on to the walls in their house to get around? Um, do they have difficulty getting up from sitting to standing? Um, is the gait stable? Is there balance? Um, are they at, at assessing their risk for falls um, at, with this also? And, and ability to, to, um, to um, navigate stairs. Are they able to navigate stairs? The Lawton, which you're seeing right now, is, is a continu continuation of the same. Um, and this is actually assessing their independent activities of daily living. And um, the score is, um, again, the higher the, it is, the more independent the, the um, older adult or community resident is. And there's um, Another lot in that you may be seeing page one off right now, which is broken down. So the, the one you saw before was more comprehensive. This is more detailed. So if you did a screening with the, the one, the prior, and we know that there were deficits, then we would follow up with this one. And there's a second page, which is more detailed. Um, and these are the independent activities of daily living that we're screening for. The ability to use a telephone to initiate a call or to um, pick up on a call. Um, shopping on your own. Do you need assistance? Food preparation, are you able to do that independently? Do you forget to turn the stove off sometimes? Um, housekeeping, can you do your usual housekeeping chores or do you request, require assistance with that? Can you do your own laundry? Um, 
Transportation, are you still driving? Should you be still be driving? This is a discussion we have with patients. We should have with patients. Um, sometimes a caregiver require us to have that discussion with a patient because just because of the family dynamics, they don't want to bring that up. And that is our job to assess the patient or um, refer the patient for assessment um, to see if they should still be driving. Um, if not, we offer them, because this is an interprofessional um, uh, evaluation, uh, patient visit. So we have our social worker who um, will give them <coughs> in information and alternate means of transportation, um, access a ride, um, what their, some insurance companies um, cover car service, how to get them um, where they need to be and not impact their independence. Because a lot of patients do not want to give up um, their ability to drive because they think they're giving up their independence. Um, are they able to schedule, um, lay out their medications and take it correctly? Um, and are they able to handle their finances? So these are the independent activities of daily living. Um, functional independence measure, which you're seeing right now, the FIMP, again, is a modified version, well, a, a shorter version, version of assessing ADLs, and it's a score of one to seven, one being low, and seven in the indicating complete independence. And you could see the, uh, the areas that we're assessing, self-care again, eating, grooming, bathing, which is ADLs, um, bowel and bladder, um, transferring, so it's a combination of ADLs and IADLs, transferring from bed to chair, using the bathroom, um, taking a shower, and again, um, getting around on your own, walking in a wheelchair, um, navigating stairs, or do you require assistance? To get the balance, gait, and mobility um, instruments are the um, get up and go and the time to get up and go, which are similar except one is time. So you have a patient um, get up, walk a straight line, turn around, and walk back towards you. Um, if it's time, it should um, happen within um, less than 10 seconds, indicates independence and, f and free mobility. And if it's, as you see, it, the numbers go up, greater than 10 seconds, they probably require um, assistance. And this is another version of the same thing, the Tenetti Balance and Gate Evaluation. This is broken down um, in more detail. There's a page one and there, there's a page two. So depending on if there, the, there was a deficit identified with the time to get up and go or just to get up and go, then this would be a, a follow-up to that and it would be more in-depth evaluation of the patient's balance, gait, um, and their ability, to fu their functional ability. And this is page two. The next of the four M's, that we're going to cover as part of the comprehensive geriatric assessment is mentation. So there's cognitive um, and memory screening tests we, that we actually perform on our service. And the first is the, um, which I'm going to cover, is the mini mental status exam or state exam. Um, is referred to differently, but still it's always the MMSC and the clock drawing test. So the MMSC is a, a screen and test for uh, memory and cognition. We ask the patients the the different questions that you see here, um, and we score it. It's scored out of 30, 30 being high and, and independent, um, and uh, to zero, and zero being low. So it's zero to uh, 30. And um, we do this at every visit that the patient comes and compare it, compares it to the, the one before, okay? So this is the MMSC. Um, the clock drawing, we start out with this, just a circle and instructions, add the numbers to the clock, add the hands to the clock, and the hands of the clock should indicate 10 after 11, okay? So this is how the test starts out. We, we have it printed, we hand the, the patient or the community resident this with these instructions, right? And these are, this is the scoring. So th one to three is considered a um, high score, three is borderline, high score to, um, to normal, and then four to six, the longer it takes to complete the task and the, um, the scoring um, indicates what may be seen um, what may be um, left off the clock, what may not be correct on the clock, and that's how it scores. So one is perfect, or almost perfect. Um, the clock indicates 10 after 11. The numbers are in the correct place, in the correct sequence. Um, two, you see, is getting a little bit, you know, not as uh, perfect. Um, and then three, you could see from three going down what may be happening there. And of course, um, we always screen patients for depression because undiagnosed depression could lead to so many other um, 
illnesses, um, factors affecting their everyday psychosocial, all of the other factors that I mentioned before as part of the geriatric assessment, um, being the undiagnosed oppression could actually affect that in an adverse way. So we screen our patient, and this is um, a geriatric one form. This is not the, but this is one form of a um, geriatric depression scale uh, instrument. Okay. Now I'm going to review the, um, the comprehensive geriatric assessment versus a problem-focused assessment. So the comprehensive geriatric assessment um, and management aims to overcome some of the limitations of the problem-focused assessment. Um, the interprofessional diagnostic process assesses an older adult's health, psychosocial, and functional capacity or ability, um, develops a coordinated integrated care and follow a plan or healthcare goals, which is focused on the individual's needs and what matters to the patient, community resident, or their family or their caregiver. Um, the initial assessment determines the care plan or healthcare goals based on the, uh, the comprehensive assessment. Um, it explicitly states the goals and aims of the treatment, um, determines required healthcare staff or interprofessional team or disciplines that's going to be included in the patient's um, healthcare team um, to obtain the treatment goals or um, healthcare goals, um, and establishes a timeline for progressive review, um, re evaluation, reassessment, and maybe um, update or um, implementing a brand new plan or continuing the plan with updates, and, and continue where the care plan or development or, or develop a corrective plan. Another brainstorm for us as providers, um, which specialties, providers, clinicians should or can be included in a patient's or community resident's comprehensive geriatric assessment interprofessional team. So um, I mentioned before that we have um, different specialties that we would like to be included um, on our service as part of our grant. We have nurses, we have medical students, um, we have um, nurse practitioner students, PA students, um, we're going to have occupational and um, physical therapy students. So what combination of persons should be um, included in a, a, a patient's or a community resident's healthcare team and what determines that? 